The Golf Biz with Mikey D, Drew, and the crew. Management, marketing, myths, and morons. Hope we make you smile. Welcome to The Golf Biz. I'm Joe Dahlstrom with Mikey D, Drew, and the crew, where our one and only goal is to make you smile as we share our stories of owning, managing, and marketing golf courses all over America. Welcome, everybody. It's going to be a great show. We got Chris Kelp. He's going to be part of the Paradigm fam. He's going to be our guest today. He's going to be sharing his path to becoming a golf professional. But before we get started, let's do our birdies and bogeys. We start every way this every week this way, so we can you know you know lighten it up a little bit, share yep. stories, right? So yep. let's start with you, Drew. What's the uh, birdie of the week? The birdie is we're back. Dobson Ranch is open again. Overseeding's over. The weather was perfect. Aside from it, would have been cool to have a little rain, but the temperatures were great. The course is in great shape. Everybody was excited. Um, so we've impacted this first week back open. It's going to roll right into the bogey, though. It's car path only. Nobody likes it. But luckily, the weather was good enough. Lots of people coming out, stretching their legs, walking. We sort of skipped fall. You know, we went straight from summer, like 110, down to like 60 degree highs. So yeah. it's been an interesting one. Yeah, you know, car path only is kind of like a mother-in-law, right? You know what? Nobody really likes it, but you kind of have to yeah, yeah. deal with it, right? Yeah. You know what I mean? Nothing else you do. Chris, your birdie of the week. Well, first, thanks for inviting me. I appreciate it, yeah, gentlemen. Man. So my birdie goes along with what Andrew is saying. It is car path only, so it's a walker's delight right now. Yeah. So that's absolutely fantastic. Unfortunately, with the bogey, it also goes with the birdie. It's walkers only. I forgot. Yesterday was the first day that I wound up walking for a while, and I forgot how old I am and how <laughs> quickly you get out of golf shape. Yeah. And I woke up, and I'm like, oh, I need some pills. I need to stretch. I need some heating pads. So that just kind of sucked. I thought I actually smelled some Ben Gay, so that is you. <laughs> yeah. No, that's just not me. Oh, okay. All right. Hey, Mikey, out in South Florida, what's your birdie and bogey? Joey, hey, I love that uh, analogy of the mother-in-law. Good stuff, man. That yeah. was funny. Um, so, hey, I've uh, birdie and bogey roll together today and it'll roll right into today's topic. In fact, is uh, today I, or this week had a wonderful opportunity to play in the Timber Tech Pro-Am, which was super cool. The Champions Tour event here at the Tasty Treat of Broken Sound had a ton of fun. Olin Brown was our pro for the day. Um, so it was a spectacular day. My bogey was I thought I was being clever by going in as a 10 handicap, you know, thinking I'm a two or three. But I actually played to a 15, so I didn't help the team one bit. Had a great day. Nonetheless, tons of great swag. And, uh, you know, so what are you going to do, I guess, when you play a few times a month? Yeah, nobody believes that you only play a few times a month. Hey, the funny part about it, though, the funny part of the day was I had to look at Olin, right? And uh, because I I three-jacked for a bogey. I was getting a shot. I was licking my chops, knocked it by, missed it coming back. He looks at me, he goes, hey, Mikey, you know what I mean? It's okay, buddy. 22 under is going to win this thing anyway. I said, uh, oh, Olin, I forgot to tell you, I'm a quitter, not a winner or a loser. (laughs) So, uh, yeah. And then he tried to give me a swing tip, which Olin, I appreciate, man. But, you know, that's just the way I swing. I'm airborne at impact. And, uh, yeah, Mm -hmm. that's how I do it. Yeah, I hear you, brother. Well, my birdie is going to be that they finally opened up visitors to Hawaii. We have a golf course in Maui, so... uh, God willing, uh, hopefully that island picks up. A lot of people need to get back to work. The bogey goes back to last week, uh, you know, when my father didn't realize who the old bald guy on the podcast was. So I'm actually past the baldness, right? So I get it. You know, You've accepted it. I've accepted it. It's, it's hereditary. And I got a hot wife, so I'm, I'm fine with it. But the bogey is this, is that ever since I lost all my hair on my head, I have hair growing everywhere else in my body that has never grown there. I had to actually get my uh, eyebrows trimmed today because they were all bushy. I got hair growing <laughs> up in my ears, my nose, my back. So that's the bogey. It seems like it's double cruelty, right? They take it off your head and grow it everywhere else. But yeah. anyway, that doesn't have to do with the golf bit as much, but I thought I would share. Yeah. So let's get started with the episode. Uh, This was a two-part series, uh, what the difference between a professional golfer and a golf professional was, right? So a few weeks ago, we had Brendan Jelly. Um, He was a junior, an amateur, collegiate uh, prodigy, won a national championship with Matt Wolf and Victor Hovland on Oklahoma State. He told us his path to becoming a professional golfer and what it takes. And it was really very interesting too. So, but we thought we'd really have to have some 
somebody come on and represent uh, what it's going to like and uh, what the difference is in, uh, between a golf professional. And technically, Mikey, Andrew, and I are all golf professionals. We view it a little differently. But, you know, we've had Jason Davis on. He's part of the Paradigm fam. He, you know, he started a long time ago, went through the PGA program and all that. But somebody we have today is very special to us. He joined our crew, uh, what, about a year ago? Almost, yeah. Almost a year. Mm -hmm. So, Chris, you had, a, you took a totally different path to the golf business. You know, mm -hmm. unlike Mikey and I and more like Drew, you actually had a career. Uh, you had one in a field that's prosperous. You were successful at it and, you know, through, you know, business and uh, accounting. And, you know, so what made you want to become a golf professional? Well, life happened. I was living <laughs> in Chicago and life happened. I moved down to Texas, El Paso specifically. That was not a fun place to go to. <laughs> and so my wife, my girlfriend at the time, Valerie Ann, she had never been to a golf tournament. So we decided to come out to the waste management or what the locals like to call the wasted management. <laughs> yeah. Nice. So we went up there. She thought it was going to be all prim and popper, you know, do that. and she didn't realize that it was just sloppy drunk people around. So anyway, we went there, had a great time. She fell in love with Phoenix. She fell in love with the weather, came back, saw a, saw a commercial about golf. I'll make golf a career. Hmm, okay, well, I have accounting and finance in my background, so came back out here, played around the golf, won to an academy, and the rest is history. Yeah. Well, you know, you came from a corporate structure, right? Yes. And, you know, in a, in a business that's very diligent, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you have to have certain credentials, you have to be qualified, and it's somewhat a, a large amount of pressure, right? Yeah. So when you got into the academy and, you know, you went through the process to learn about the golf business, what mm -hmm. was your reaction throughout that? Well, my first reaction was, hey, I'm going to I'm going to be a golfer. Yeah, I'll be in the PGA, everything else like that. Then you found that the road wasn't as easy as it could be. And then next thing you know, you found that, unfortunately, it's still elitist. It's still archaic. And I scratched my head for a second because I'm not saying that I'm anti-PGA or anything else like that. But I've got the beard. I've got tattoos. I, I want to be a bit of a newer breed of type of PGA of American type yeah. of person. Yeah. So just kept going with that. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, so Drew? Uh, I was just going to say for, for someone who's, you know, wide eyed, doesn't really know much about golf still, what is even the difference? Like you, you said you went to an academy. Is that like what you do to get your PGA card or well, like what is the, because I know Jason is, you know, PGA professional too. Is it just an academy or is there more to it than just going into that class? So there are a bunch of academies throughout the entire United States. I went to one that I'll just not talk about. <laughs> and long story short, it's just you go there and they give you the foundation. It's almost like a trade school, put yeah. it that way. Okay. And they build up your information, your history, your knowledge. And then they want, want you to do is then go out there and go to the PGA. So there are a lot of actual universities right now that have a PGM credential and everything else that you can go to get your PGA and then go to the next level. Okay. Absolutely. So when you uh, went through the different classes, right, you graduated and you were used to probably getting paid pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, and you got into an industry, especially when you get started, it's not so much that way. Were you prepared for that? Did you do the research or was it somewhat of a surprise? No, it's actually, <laughs> this was a hot topic in my graduating class. I had people who had never earned, a, we'll say a good living before. Yeah. yeah. So long story short, it was, I don't want to get paid 10 or $13 an hour minimum wage or anything else like that. And it's like, well, how can you live on that? And I said, well, work hard, put your, put your, um, put all your efforts into it and you're going to build whatever you want to build. And that's always been my mindset. That's always been my work ethic. When I first started my corporate career, I got paid in the low twenties. By the time I did that, it was fivefold. So, you know, you take a pay cut, you do something else, but you get what you put into it. Absolutely. Hey, Mikey, let's get you involved in this show here too. So remember what the show is about. This is part two. This is about the golf professional. Um, in Mikey D, P to B language translation, how would you summarize the difference between a golf professional and a professional golfer? So, well, let's just begin with my experience this week. Um, a lot of, uh, well, a lot of golf professionals may have had this experience. A lot of average golfers or daily weekend golfers may have not. But here at the uh, the Timber Tech Pro Am, it was pretty special. I mean, we get there, we get a beautiful bag tag and 
pro v's on the driving range and a full spread for food and i you know, a swag bag that's awesome. And I'm looking around at these pros thinking, man, they do this every week, right? And here I am, I've been in the golf business for 23 years and I consider myself a pretty good uh, lurper when it comes to, you know, making the old reciprocal phone call. And I got to call <laughs> six places before I get a cart fee somewhere. So that is a big difference. These guys are playing the best golf courses. Uh, tour pros I'm talking about, yeah. professional golfers. Best golf courses on the planet every week carte blanche, swag, you name it, Pro V's on the range, all the way, perfect conditions, never have to wait on the group in front of you, pretty tasty. Golf professionals, well, I'm not even so sure, I know many golf professionals that can even get in golf, typically if you are um, a head golf professional or that, you're pretty busy, right? So I don't really, if you don't want to play golf, probably, you know, get into the business, um, at least that, that's my perception, uh, but, uh, you know, I, I do a pretty good job as a, as a professional or a golf professional. Now I do a pretty damn good job of uh, selling ladies shoes and folding sweaters. <laughs> so that's probably the biggest cha difference. So let me summarize. That was a little long winded. So the professional golfer travels the world to the most beautiful places on earth, makes millions of dollars and scores hot chicks. Right. And the golf mm -hmm. professional yeah. barely gets by slinging, you know, ladies shoes and folding sweaters. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well said. Well perfect. said. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they don't play as much golf as they think. Exactly. Yeah. I was actually one of the first things somebody I met, a customer at Dobson who'd worked in golf for a long time before. He said, "Dude, worst thing you could ever do to your golf game, work in golf." Yeah. Well, it's like anything else. You go to a restaurant, you know, and you you don't like food anymore after that. Yeah. You know. So, yeah. To summarize it, really, I think uh, my answer would be. A professional golfer gets to give shit to people, right? The caddy, you know, the media, whoever they want, they're cool, right? And the golf professional eats the shit, right? Yeah. You know what I mean? That's part of our job, mm -hmm. you know? Man? Yeah. And I've become really good at it. So Chris, let's get back to you. So you graduate from the academy. Um, you Valedictorian. Valedictorian, wow, wow. wow. That's very <laughs> add a, cool. Add another one to the nerd column. Yes. yes. Hey Please Joey, you didn't ask him that on his resume, bro? You didn't ask him that in the interview <laughs> when he graduated <laughs> in his class at the academy? Yeah. No. Well, I'm gonna get to Chris and I's relationship and all of ours because it, it was actually, I think it's been a, a really kind of a wonderful story story and a mm -hmm. great partnership between all of yeah. us. So, so you graduate, right? Then you go out, you get a job, um, with, it was a larger management company at a, at a fairly busy golf course. Right. And right. then what, you know, what was your role? What did you like about it? What didn't you like about it? Well, I got in, they gave me the assistant <clears throat> golf pro position. At first they didn't want to hire me cause well, I had a beard. So I had to <laughs> sacrifice this beautiful <laughs> chop here and I had to be like a naked mole rat for a while. And everything was great, except on the weekends, I actually had to wear a shirt and tie. Wow. Talk about stuffy. Mm -hmm. And even on the weekends, and it's still 85 degrees out there, <laughs> I'm sweating through, and I'm like, what the hell just is a, this? Just a disclaimer here, at Dobson, he still has to wear a shirt. All right. <laughs> yeah, sure. Tie's optional now. <laughs> so it was great. It was just, you, you just started seeing some of the hierarchy and the higher clientele come in and then you're just like all right you're kind of a douche yeah mm -hmm. absolutely yeah. so you felt like one or when you worked there both okay yeah or you thought they like, were and what I, it was both so uh, you cool. said they gave you and it sounds really prestigious right they gave you the assistant golf pro that's not that doesn't sound entry level to me and for someone just mm -hmm. out of the academy like what did you actually do as the assistant golf pro well, I, some of the things that I do here at Dobson, you know, I was helping with the tournaments. I was doing some scoring, uh, T-sheet management, uh, merchandising. <clears throat> so it was a lot of that, but it was a lot of butt kissing too. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, by the look in your face, because you don't hide it very well and, <laughs> you know, and uh, some of the comments, uh, yeah. you didn't love it, right? Were you thinking about giving up on the golf business at that point? Or did you think that it just wasn't a fit? At that point, it just wasn't a fit. Okay. And then I was never going to give up. Then a buddy of mine got me a job at an OEM, which will be nameless. And then that didn't fit. And now I'm at Paradigm, which is a great fit. Okay. What's OEM? Original Equipment Manufacturer. Oh, okay, cool. All right. So let's go to the part of your life that I'm sure that, you know, even more than your beautiful wife, Val, and mm -hmm. your, your your beautiful children, this probably this moment probably meant the most to you of anything when you joined the team at Dobson, right? Oh, absolutely. It's <laughs> yeah. like on the top five. Yeah. <laughs> <There it is. laughs> so 
full disclosure, I had met Chris a few times. Um, I definitely knew that he was smart. I definitely knew he was passionate. Uh, my uh, uh, concern and my hesitation was that you came from a very institutional background, right? I mean, mm -hmm. there is not much movement when it comes to accounting, right? It's fairly black and white. You do it, right? And, and that corporate world is very stiff. It's very procedural. Mm -hmm. And it's never that I didn't think that you were highly qualified or a great, amazing person. It's just that could you fit into our system, which is chaotic, right? It's something that we do. So you join Paradigm, um, you come to Dobson, and you know what were your initial thoughts about the difference between the first property, golf property you worked at, and now Dobson with, with us? Oh, it was night and day. It was like corporate versus non-corporate. At first, Dobson, I was like, oh, it's a little unstructured. <laughs> like yeah. you gotta, my very first perception was, hey, I got this phone call from this California surfer dude. He's just like, hey, man, you want to come in for a for an interview? I'm like, yeah, cool. Let's do it. Yeah. I come in shirt and tie and everything else. He's like, what's up? Yeah. And, you know, he's made comments about his beard at least five times. And we're only 10 minutes into this. Yeah. But seriously, in the interview, too, from my perception, he goes, oh, dude, I love that you have like a little scruff. Like, oh, man, I'm so excited to be here. Like that's uh, that's very high on it. If we're top five, the beard is definitely top two. I, it's fighting with Val. Yeah. The only question I get is, do you even know how to surf? No. OK, yeah. I get it. He looks like a surf. Yeah. I get it. Yeah, yeah. I went surfing once, was really hung over, uh, paddled out. My shoulders were sore and I went and slept on the beach. OK. Yep. Well, there you go. There you go. All right. So you get interviewed by Drew, mm -hmm. uh, a 24, 25 year old guy that never worked in the golf business that came from slinging ice cream sandwiches. So mm. now what are you thinking? Were you doubting a company that would put somebody <laughs> that hasn't gone through the regular process responsible for the operation? Oh, no, not abs not whatsoever. It was just like, <laughs> all right, so we got the kid. We have new. We have the new management. My buddy Brandon is the assistant superintendent. We yeah. both went to the same academy one of my best friends. And he's like, Hey man, I put your name in here. I'm like, okay, great. Have the interview. Mikey, do you know how long it took him to hire me? <laughs> four months. Uh, four months. Yeah. Well, damn, we usually hire in four minutes and I think it came from me. <laughs> yeah. I, that's what I told you. Even yeah. when I talked to you, right. Yeah. It was because the one thing is that people have a comfort zone. Mm -hmm. They've learned a certain way. And I've always said I'd rather treat I'd rather teach somebody that's never done it before than try to give a lobotomy, right? right? Mm -hmm. And we had some very heart to heart discussions, right? I mm -hmm. mean, I didn't pull any punches, and neither did you, right? And it wasn't about right or wrong. I mean, I never doubted your skills, your talent, your passion, or anything, right? You've done a plus amazing work, and well, you, you know you're going to be part of the family forever, hopefully. Um, but you did take some type of concession on your your part too, right? To kind of buy in. Oh yeah, absolutely. So. As I was going through this golf career, I realized that, you know, I do have some customer service skills and everything else. And I found that when I was talking on the phone, selling products with the OEM, and then I was really good at greeting people, checking them and everything else. I said, I can do this. I just had to learn a certain way how to do it. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And in, in like our process too, wasn't created you know, from an article we read in the Harvard Business Review, you know, we've all shared our stories, you know, they're very unremarkable on how we got to where we are. Mm -hmm. And it really just comes down to people and treating people nice. And we say it all the time just to be cool, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, the cool is may make the other person feel cool too. So, um, so you've stepped in, you know, we gave you a chance and that's kind of the way we worded it. And you continue to grow and take on more responsibility, you've done amazing. And now that you've actually gone down, you know, uh, this path too, you know, there is the golf business splits off, right? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I'm kind of, you know, I'm a big one that and this is the first time I ever asked you this, so I'm putting you on the spot, but you know, you have to find your passion, what you're really good at. So there's like a merchandising side, there's a marketing side, there's a side, there's an operational side to it. Um, you know, and a lot of people want to become an executive. I can tell you that I don't know really what an executive does so much, really. You know what I mean? It doesn't mean you can't grow and do multiple things, but you know, um, so what path do you really enjoy doing the most? Not marketing. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> everything, everything, but marketing. everything, but, okay. everything but marketing. Well, we got that handled. So yeah, we're good. we have that handled. So well, good. Dude, you were smash hit with the hashtag. Don't be like Chris. Yeah, Your no first doubt. debut was great. Yeah. So that video, all I did was I channeled an I thought inner that was friend. Hilarious. Yeah. I just channeled a friend's <laughs> attitude many times. And I'm like, you know what? I can do it even better and yeah. more outrageous. So watch yeah, more videos on that. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Mikey, you know what? You've 
you've actually, uh, your significant other, the love of your life works, you know, with you down there. Um, and I would say that she is, comes from more of a mindset like Chris, you know what I mean? Very structured, very procedural. Um, how have you adapted uh, to that? We, uh, we divvy it up pretty fair and square. And so she has a master's degree in education. She is a school teacher. And if you ever needed to be organized and plan your day, uh, that's one profession you would have to do it in. So a lot of that, I mean, hey, I'm not going to downplay it because I'm no good at it and I know it. Um, actually, the organizational skills and the planning and uh, the procedural work that she brings and the stability to the operation is huge because I am so awful at it. So that's why I'm blessed to have her on the other side when it comes to filling the place up, making sure everything, even when it's totally chaotic, actually goes as smooth as possible. Super cool in building and growing the business and the customer acquisition, which is my strength. I could pour all my uh, heart and soul into it. And I don't think it's one way or another. I don't think it's something that she can't do. It's just that it actually doesn't energize her like it does me. And I can't not do the other stuff. It just depletes me of all my energy and t- gets me off my focus. So that's the key. Absolutely. We don't want you off your focus. That, no. That's very dangerous. He has focus. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. What exactly focus is that? You're just talking that? about when your Adderall wears off? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Hey, no, no. Sometimes it looks unfocused, but it's sincerely very focused, laser uh, yeah. focused, dude. Oh, Even yeah. though it no looks doubt. like it's yeah, a yeah. little ma- lay ma- uh, you know. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. No, I got no. I got another one. Uh, too. Was that a Joe Biden just now? What the hell was that? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, I got another one, too, though, Chris. I'm curious, too, because we've talked about it in different episodes in different ways. But even like you just talked about, you've got a part. You've got one or two facets you really enjoy. And, and you know, the marketing happens to be a, a majority of my role, which is what kind of like Mikey's done at PBN. And we do everywhere. We try to find you know, a team that they all can help each other instead of having the same 10 people. Cause if we had 10 of me or 10 of Mikey, nothing would ever get done, but everyone sure would have a huge smile. <laughs> and, uh, with you guys, you know, I think traditionally in golf, a lot more people were excited about the, you know, the merchandising and the stuff like that. Did you notice, or out of the, all the people in your Academy, could you kind of tell that different people were going to actually fit those molds or did, were a lot of the people have the same interest? Did they all kind of buy into the old school mentality and, you know, the control and compliance, the very black and white, the, the rate integrity and all that stuff? No. So the group that I was with, I had two guys who thought they're going to school to become professional golfers. <laughs> I had, That's I a had, good start. I had a gentleman who was a little bit older than me and he was semi-retired. So mm-hmm. he decided he wanted to be like a starter. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. then I've got, so out of that, I think only three of us out of my entire graduating class, no, no rip on them, but the three of us probably are the most successful out of the entire graduating yeah. class. Yeah. Well, that makes yeah. sense. Because no, one's a club builder, one's a maintenance guy, and then you got me. Like, yeah. Well, yeah. No, yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. Well, and I think that's kind of a good thing, right? I think if you had turned around and said, oh yeah, everybody was the same, they bought into all this old stuff, mm-hmm. then it would just, golf would continue to struggle. But I think it, at its core to see people were actually able to grasp onto parts of it during the academy, even if they never really delivered or followed through with what they learned, just knowing that at least there's different people being brought up because those are going to be the people. There's a lot more people going through an academy or a program than there are just getting jobs on a whim in a golf course and finding out they love it. So that's really what's going to kind of control the future for golf. Right. And then there's two things, two misconceptions about getting into the golf business. One is you're going to make shit ton of money. So again, (laughs) that's not true. And then the other one is I'm going to pimp out my PGA or anything else and get free golf everywhere around I go. And that's yeah. one thing that just kind of just irks me. It's like, yeah. you know what? Don't call them and say, hey, you know, I'm so-and-so from whatever. I'm PGA. You know, like, you got a good rate for me or can I play for free? Yeah. yeah. Well, I at least appreciate the call. What I really don't like, and you've seen this in action, both of you, is I don't like the walk in, slap your card on the table and say, yeah, yeah. it's me. Yeah. yeah. Well, because like episode one, we're not saving lives. Yeah. You know exactly. what I mean? We have bills to pay too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know? So, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, there's other paths too, right? So you haven't worked at a private club yet. So there's there's public, there's private, there's resort. Mm-hmm. You know, there's the three different business models. Um, do, which one of those three do you think you're going to you gravitate and be the best fit for and enjoy the most? 
Well, not being on the private side, so I can't really talk about that. I just know that there's more headaches involved with that, especially with the members. And, you know, I live on the 13th hole here, you know, yeah. Yeah. gentlemen like this guy here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't complain. Yeah. yeah. I actually like a little bit of the headaches with the public side. It's yeah. just, it just makes me laugh going, well, I paid this amount or I did this. It's like, why are you getting so pissed off? Yeah, yeah. Like, like you're you're playing golf. Exactly. It's, it's all golf. good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's all good. It, well, so it sounds like the public, which is good because we have no interest in private mm -hmm. um, because the private business model is not about profit. It's not really about anything other than just facility, facilitating the needs of some rich old dude. You know what I mean? Which is mm -hmm. fine. You know what I mean? In, a lot of times there, it's about how good you can play so they can talk at dinner about they played with this guy that shot 65. Well, big right. deal. That guy, once again, would lose to a 112-year-old, so he's really not that cool. <laughs> um, so when you were going through the school, because I think this is a, valuable, uh, a valid point, right? Because it's not that you don't like marketing, I get it. It's just not your DNA. It, that's right. totally normal. But how much time and on all that schooling did they talk about marketing, sales? They talked a lot about sales. They talked a lot about cart fees, getting a new fleet, merchandising. When it came to marketing, very little. Yeah. Yeah. But was there any process in even teaching you how to be nice to people, the importance of it? There was, but it was more of, hey, get the person in the door, sell them that, get them out the door, and start over. Yeah. And how does that compare to our way? Our way? No. Our way is we treat everybody like a king or a queen. Yeah. Or Makes try. it easier, right? Yeah. Makes it easier to sell it to them. Right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, the golf business has never been known to be very sophisticated as far as marketing, too. So, and I think that our approach, um, and I'm so glad that you've embraced it, not only do I think you appreciate it, you've, been, you've participated in it now, too, mm -hmm. because, you know, it, you know, I think it's very undervalued marketing and sales in golf, and I don't know why, because it's a very competitive business. And, you know, we've talked about this in past episodes that most golf courses think that if their course is in the good shape, and they give mediocre service that their golf course will just prosper. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. Mikey, yeah. what do you think of that? That is probably the biggest misconception in golf. Yeah. Just build it and they will come. And, uh, you know, in this business, especially being that there really is no, you know, silver bullet to fix in it all. It's actually all the small things and the little things that you do and, uh, the, all the little incremental, it's a game of yards, you know? So, um, to your point, uh, about it. It's really too about developing a team. Actually, you said earlier, Chris, about the starter and, you know, as a head golf professional or whatever in a daily fee golf property, the VP of everything cool, whatever you want to call yourself, um, as the, as the lead guy, it's really about building and developing a team because so many people like golf course managers and that overlook the starter, overlook the, the ranger and the leader of the day, we call them. Um, overlook the frontline staff and they don't do anything to actually because that guy's impression at the first tee and that presentation and how cool and thankful that guy is as, as your starter that gal is that that customer is there to, sh to lay it out there and tell all the people like all the cool things they can do is just as important as what you're doing as the head golf professional or VP of everything cool whatever. So, yeah, I even I would even absolutely. venture to say that the starter and the LOD both could be more important because in the shop, if we're kind of bound there, we get them in, we set them up, we, you know, we get them pumped up and send them down. But the starter is really the last face they see before they leave and go hang out and spend their four hours, four and a half hours relaxing, having a great time. And the LOD is the person out there checking on them, making sure that we're covering all their interests and they're having that good time. And it's you're you're exactly right, Mikey. I think those positions are definitely overlooked and undervalued at a lot of courses. That's why out here, I don't know if you guys have it there. A lot of courses just have a PA. They just, mm -hmm. the person in the shop is just yelling to Smith foursome, please come to the first tee. And then if there's <laughs> eight people over there, they say, Hey, there's eight of you. There should only be four. And <laughs> like what's personal about that? Yeah, yeah. that is hilarious. Those PAs <laughs> do crack me up unless you're going to have uh, what's the guy's name? Michael buffer dude on the PA actually <laughs> doing the announcement. And you know, yeah, absolutely. Not very cool. So, Chris, uh, you, you came on board and uh, you started out. You did, you've always done very, very well, right? And there's been moments through that I could see it in your eyes, mm. right? And I could see it in your reaction, right? Your head was about to explode. And it was because you care, you're mm -hmm. passionate, right? Right. And it was a little bit out of your comfort zone, you know, because we really have a mindset that just let's fix the problem, let's smile. And 
I'm not a big uh, proponent of arguing or debating with people, not because I think the other people, the customer's right. I do not think the customer's always right. Of course they're not. But I, our job is to make them feel like they're right as we persuade them in a fair outcome so they can leave us alone, right? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And try to treat them nice. So, um, so when you went throughout that process, I mean, how many times did you go home to Val and say some very not nice things about myself? <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, never, ah. never. So the one thing that I do, yeah, I vent, I vent to Val. She, she's the rock. You know, she'll listen to all the stupid golf stories. What's going on in the day? How many times I'm sink that putt? Even though I'll tell her five times before I even get home, <laughs> and then she'll sit there. So the one thing that I've always said though is the one thing that I will take away from anything that you told me, Joe, is say no with a yes mentality. Yeah. And ever since I adopted that, and then I realized, you know, like you said, we're not saving lives. We're Mm -hmm. playing golf. No reason to get so pissed off because you recorded a six and you're not going to get that course record. Yeah. So once I really adopted that mentality, then things all changed for me. Yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, you rose up pretty fast. You are the leader. And, you know, I've watched you, you know, and you in our system, you know, we have somebody that takes full responsibility of the guest experience throughout the day, you know, that understands who's on the tee, who needs to be paired up, you know, what the four hole times are. You are interacting with a ton of people, right? Yes. Yeah. And uh, how, what, how do you like that part of the role? Oh, oh, I love it. I yeah. love it because we have such a diverse crew. We have, let's see, you said, what did you always call me? You said I was... Oh, I can't remember. You, you was it behind your back or to your face? No, it was to my face. Okay. It was you, you said it was because I'm so structured and I like everything. But oh, your you, comfort zone. No, it was it was another word. Stiff. No, mm. but similar to stiff. Okay. But anyway, we have such rigid? a rigid. No, not Richard. Now we'll think about that. Yeah, yeah, Val and I just talked about this. Yeah, so yeah. anyway. We have such a diverse crew. You know, we got the cool laid back California kid. <laughs> we got the Chicago tough, you know, guy, and then we have our we have our young. Your, our youngsters, our millennials, or the kids that like to call them. I was going here with this. Yeah, 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 I love yeah. it. You started. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So by talking to everybody, it is just like, a, you know, there's never a time where the day just goes by minute by minute. You're looking at the clock. You have no idea what's going on here. It's, oh, crap, look at that. I've already been here for eight, nine hours. Where did the time flock? Yeah. Because you talk to all these different kids and all the different personalities, see how everybody interacts with each other and listen to how they think. And then you're like, Oh, you know what? I like that idea. I'm going to take that for my own. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's a game of chess, mm-hmm. you know, it really is. And, and I'm glad you brought up the millennial thing because I actually referred to you in a past episode because, you know, we discussed at length, you and I, I man to man, just, you know what I mean? It was not a <laughs> reprimand. man. It was just two people talking to each other. Mm-hmm. Right. And it's not because I think I'm any brighter than you. I could lose, I'd lose to you in trivial pursuit a hundred times out of a hundred. Right. But I have experienced the millennial generation more in the mindset because I've been in this business for a long time because mm-hmm. you probably didn't deal with that as much as an accountant, right? Mm-mm. Yeah. No, not whatsoever. Yeah. And so I think that is when we talked about the four stages, once again, paradigm OG, the four stages of, you know, understanding the millennial mindset and learning how to manage mentor and motivate. Uh, the first step is anger. Right. You just don't understand because we grew up where force and fear worked. You know what I mean? And it doesn't, does it? That they, So you get angry, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it was eating you inside, right? It was. I, I couldn't wrap around, wrap my head around. I'm like, let's be honest here. I'm like, why aren't they working as hard as me? <laughs> yeah. I don't understand this. <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. And then after we talked, right, you go to the next stage, right? You mm-hmm. go and you overcompensate right? And you don't hold them accountable. You just try to be nice, which mm-hmm. isn't really what I meant by it, but it's normal. I did the same thing. So you overcompensate and then you leave the room knowing what you just said and you just sold your soul, right? Mm-hmm. Then you go in the bathroom and you vomit, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. What <laughs> stage th- What stage are you at right now? <laughs> I'm just getting past the vomit stage. Yeah. So yeah. I'm still getting past so the just, point you of- You just crested the hill. You're yeah, on your yeah, way down yeah, now. Yep. And I think that you're actually, the next stage is laughing, right? Because you actually do it, you buy in. And Mm -hmm. I'm I'm a big, I'm a big proponent of fake it till you make it because, and I, you know, people talk about being real, but when people's real attitudes are ones that are detrimental to themselves or it's just rude, that's not real. It's just being a dick, Mm -hmm. right? 
-hmm. know what I mean? I mean, no matter who you are, right? So if you need to fake it, eventually it becomes real and genuine. So you've done brilliant at this. The team responds to you so much better now, right? Mm -hmm. So I think you're at the last stage, actually the third stage, right? Where you, it still irks you a little bit, but you see it working and it just makes you laugh. Oh, absolutely. It makes me laugh. The, the team actually sees my true personality now. Yeah. I will say some sarcastic stuff. I will be over the top, just crazy. <laughs> and then they respond. And one of the best compliments that I've received in the last couple of months is, hey, you know what? We've seen Chris really chill out for the last three weeks. It's been a pleasure working with yeah. him. Yeah. So ever since I've heard that, I'm just like, yep, we're going to go this route. Absolutely. Perfect. And, you know, in fairness, right? I know that it makes you feel better. It makes them feel better. Mm -hmm. But you don't have to agree just to agree. But do you think that it actually helps their performance better with that mindset and the way you're managing them? I've completely seen a change. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. 100%. It's just not because I'm trying to kiss your ass because I well, don't that's do okay. that. <laughs> yeah. However, I have seen a completely different change yeah. now. So it's a great working relationship. Does Val like you more now when you go home because you're less frustrated? I would like to say so, but I'm the cook, so yes. Okay, cool. <laughs> By the way, his wife is super cool and an excellent card player. So, you know, yeah. at the Dobson Dollar, she did dominate uh, last time. So, and then the fourth stage, just so everybody knows, is full and total acceptance that this is the mindset moving forward. It's not generational, it's relational. Paradigm OG on that one. <laughs> and it really does work. And, you know, we talked about it last week. It really is good for the person doing it that way. It's the good for, it's good for the person receiving it. And maybe it's better, right? You know, so, so that's very cool that, you know, that you've embraced it, you know, so well. So, you know, you work with, with Drew and, uh, you know, Jacqueline and the crew too. And how do you feel like it's meshed in, at, at Dobson based on everybody's skill sets? Oh, it's, it's meshed great. We, we know who does what, who can do better stuff. I send people out and go, hey, you know what, deal with that because I just don't want to. Or <laughs> deal with that because, one, I want you to get some more experience, right? Exactly. So we have this, um, you know, Drew and I, sometimes we butt our heads. Oh, and, yeah. And we've actually talked about this. And, and I'm, we're like, you know what, you're like my little brother. I mean, yeah. he actually brought it up. I'm like, yeah, but I just can't punch you in the face. Yeah, yeah. no doubt. Yeah. Well, that's all right. Just don't yeah. do, just, just just do, do it off, off the property. Off property. Yeah. 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 yeah, And maybe that could be a video. There it is. No the boxing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's the new who go who lasts three rounds. Yeah. So Drew, you've seen the transformation yeah. too. And you know, I was involved with it because I relate to Chris. I, I you know, I've been around a little longer. We're similar in age, you know, yeah. but I understand the mindset that you know, I just went through a little sooner. Like what have you seen and things like that too, as far as uh, the, the overall approach? Yeah, you know, and I, I could definitely see it and I, and on the back end, you know, that's that's what it was back before Chris sort of had this revelation and in the beginning it wasn't that there was anything too bad or anything that he was doing wrong or, you know, what have you, but the you know, some of the younger people were coming and they were like, dude, I just, I don't know what to do. I'm always getting yelled at. And I'm like, <laughs> I was sitting there. You didn't get yelled at. He just told you you were doing it wrong. And, <laughs> and that's when I'd really go to him. I was like, dude, you know what they walked away thinking when you told yeah. them, Hey, Hey, do this, do this. They took that as yelling. You didn't even no, raise I your know. voice. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I feel like I hope that, you know, with yeah. you, I helped them come to those realizations that it's, yeah. it's less about what you're even actually doing, just how they're seeing it. It goes back to what you oh, said, less about what you do or say, but how you make them feel. And, yeah. and so on the back end to try and help them out, I said, well, all right, well, look at it this way, right? He kind of treats you guys like his own kids and that's great. And I said, so treat him like your parent. I said, you know, trash day is Wednesday every week. So why do you make your parents every week tell you to take the trash out? Why don't you just do it? You know how much happier they're going to be? They're probably going to give you something. They're probably going to be through the roof. They're going to give you praise. And so now yeah. when they come in and they they just see Chris stewing, they see it's busy. <laughs> they see that it's now they'll walk up. They say, yeah. hey, Chris, I'm going to go down and start. Is that cool with you? And yeah. he just lights up like a Christmas tree. Absolutely. You know, you know and like Chris, we've shared, it was never like another paradigm OG. It's not sometimes you have to do what works rather than what's right or wrong. And mm -hmm. somebody that's very principled, that's very hard, right? And so would I say that people sometimes think I meant like, you know, cheating, stealing, lying, right? That's wrong, right? But you're, you're doing what works, right? And the reason why I share that was a big deal for you is because you are so strong and so good at the rest of the job, 
I mean, in the golf business. I mean, you're going to move on to be wildly successful in the golf business, hopefully with our company. Oh, thank you. And, uh, you know, and that's the reason why I was so rigorous on you to go ahead and buy in on that part because that was the last component. And, and if I thought you had a magic wand to get everybody to think like you, which is the way I grew up too, I would have let you use it, but I already tried. That wand doesn't exist. No kidding. <laughs> and if it did, I would have perfected it by now. I tried, imagine if I tried to manage Mikey like that. You know what I mean? Jeez, with force and fear. You know what I mean? He goes to the abyss. He moon, he Michael Jackson moonwalks right hey, out. <laughs> I, uh, I was on the 13th hole somewhere real pretty just now. I, yeah, I gotta yeah. be honest with you. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so Chris, so, you know, golf business wise, you know what, overall, you know, you could be honest too, you know, with, with everything, right. Mm -hmm. Is that after being with us about a year and it's not about us, forget about, because I say us, you're in it with us. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, from one to 10, how much are you enjoying the golf business? Oh, 10, 12, if I could. I mean, it's the complete opposite of where I was at. Well, very cool. Yeah. Well, that feels good. Yeah. Absolutely. And another thing too, is that when this last topic about the millennial thing, so when mm. one comes on, and, and just so everybody knows out there that thinks maybe I'm the wuss here on this one, we also do beat up the, you know, the younger generation or the millennial mindset that whines too. So this definitely goes both ways. Mm -hmm. They need to learn to eat some shit and, you know, don't whine, right? So when they come up and they say something and you might boil a little bit, mm -hmm. do you ever think of the bald head with the glasses with the smirk? Like I said, <laughs> say no with the yes mentality. Yeah. Cool, cool. Hey, Mikey, you got it. You got anything to share? Well, I was going to go ahead real quick and just share with you what golf pros and pro golfers have in common. And I've never and yet have seen the perfect round of golf, just like I've never seen the perfect day. And so if you do have a perfectionist's mentality where, you know, expects things to go a certain way and likes a certain plan, the golf business, especially in a daily fee golf property, will frustrate you or it will be a learning curve because every day is a little bit of improv. There is situations and pop-ups and stuff that happens throughout the day that was not planned for. Um, granted, you can be prepared. I'm not saying don't prepare, you know, um, but you know what? The day is always, especially when you're running the rounds that we're doing um, and you have the amount of guests that are coming using the range and the amount of moving parts that you have, you have to think improv. Nothing will go perfect but it's all going to work out in the end because it always does. That's a fact. Um, I gotta so give. the other thing is the key to it with millennials and as far as, and I think this could go for anybody. I know it goes for me. And this is a mindset I wake up to every day because of years and years of training going through, you know, all different of things. But is it's a get to rather than a have to. I don't think anybody likes telling them that they have to do this and they have to do that. But rather, it's a pretty cool thing that you get to do what you're doing in an atmosphere and an environment that you are and you can bring anything you want to the table like you can't screw it up number one d bad don't be a dick and just be cool because it's all going to work out in the end right mm -hmm. but two just try and do the right thing and even if it turns out not to be the right thing at least you did it with the right intentions and it's all going to work out in the end anyway because nobody got hurt so shake it up yeah to talk about what mikey was saying in the beginning you know that no days are going to be perfect i have to give him a lot of credit because on the surface this little piece of advice he gave me when i started at dobson <laughs> it sounds just like a mikeyism and he was like oh dude you guys are so busy here like if you guys aren't behind on the t something's wrong like you should always <laughs> be back and and i didn't really understand that at first i was like oh there's mikey like i heard how much they like yeah. chaos and and then once i got to understand it you know and the the inner workings and i won't bore everyone with what it really means but once you lose time if you're packed and there's no open tea times you have to stay behind if you catch up you're just jamming people out there you're making everyone's experience worse and what Mikey really helped me understand with giving me that piece of advice is that customer service managing people's expectations and stuff like that is going to be just as important if not more important than the golf professional reading you know am I supposed to hit the ball a, a ball outside to the right or <laughs> half a ball or whatever it is so yeah. you know you're right we got big decisions to make just like them hey yeah, you know what and and in addition, right? So like, it's not even you, you could have the perfect day, but when you have three, 400 guests a day mm -hmm. coming to you, I mean, four, you know, three groups show up late. This guy shows up with six more golfers than what he anticipated. This happens, that shakes up, this cart breaks down, they're doing this. They stop at the turn to come in and grab hot dogs. So now you got people back. It's a, all assortments of things mm -hmm. like, so you know what we're, you know, just roll with it, fix the problem, then move on to the next. And 
have a great time and you have to enjoy that. You yeah. genuinely have to enjoy a thing like that in order. Otherwise, you'll go bonkers. You'll go sideways and want to like never get, come back. You, you forgot about the number one thing that Mikey does when total chaos breaks. Turn, Turn up, up the music. <laughs> <laughs> I have seen Turn it guys up, baby. come in. You know, rum shot, otter pop, turn up the music, baby. Come on. It's this is a, a true story. Day. I was actually in the Palm Beach National Golf Shop. And, you know, they have the East Coast New York, New York guys. And you talk about Chicago people. These people share their feelings, right? <laughs> uh, this guy, These two guys come in and they look at Mikey and it was unbelievable. The tone, the language, blah, 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 threatening, all this stuff. Mikey just got this big smile. He grabbed the iPad and he said, hey, Irv, can you repeat that? I can't really hear you. And he just turned the music so loud it almost blew his eardrums out. Irv turned, uh, uh, turned around, walked out the door. Mikey yeah. went game a hug yeah. before you know it. They well, were no, it was actually all in good spirits. Yeah, no, you know, know what? And there's some answers that don't have an answer. I mean, how are you going to answer that? So the genuine thing to do, and it has to be authentic, is to really let people know the real perspective is not necessarily their perspective even. The real perspective is it's a beautiful day. We're going to have a great time, and we're glad you're here. I can't tell you how good it's to see you, and you're feeling great. Life is good. All right, let's go. You know, I mean, yeah. how else do you answer something like, you know, so ridiculous? I think being a terrible listener, which Mikey is, really does benefit him <laughs> when the, in these yeah. situations. I don't think he hears what the guy's even saying, but he does actually you know, do a brilliant like, job winning the back. Mm. I mean, Chris, you've been in a situation where somebody's coming to you with some just absolutely ridiculous statement or question or, or something. And it was just like, now, do you actually say, no, that was ridiculous. That was stupid. <laughs> or do you just say, hey, the great news is the sun is shining. You're playing golf, baby. You're looking good. Yeah, you feeling you feel. Oh, baby, you're feeling good. We're going to have a great day. Cause it's a great day. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. All right, can't all right. tell them I'm ridiculous. I'm like, hey, go out there and shoot that course record of 61. Yeah. They just laugh at me and walk out. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, like. Yeah. yeah. No, I love that lately too, Mikey, your new thing. We just got a basketball hoop down at Dobson. So I'm excited to be a little more like you guys, but now I'm going to beg Joe for a hammock. Cause you've been on that kick lately, throwing the golf balls Ooh. in the hammock. Maybe hey, that was day. pretty cool, man. Yeah, I've yeah. got, I've got dudes messaging me. They're next in line for the free hammock toss. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's going to be a new carnival game Good around stuff. the world. Talk no, about no. paradigm. OG. No, right I know. there. <laughs> Mikey. So is that, hey guys, and if I'll share too, cause I wrote, I wrote this down earlier because what kind of to allude to what we're speaking about a big role and as as a leader of a golf team here in the daily fee business right where things can go sideways and everything dude and what it is and 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 we talk so much about sales dude and people don't necessarily a lot of people don't understand what sales is and sales is really just a transference of energy and emotion and so if you can show if you can show up with that bundles of positive energy and a great vibe and and just and and transfer that that positive emotion to people dude because there are a lot of people regardless of no matter what happens or how perfect the day even is they just have those they have that negative tendency right a lot of people man all day long but the only way to overcome that is with an uber positivity that just people are infected with so even like the most negative crotchety guys because i hear it all the time from other people like god that guy's such a crotch and i was like that guy's never been a crotch to me ever once in my life i said dude but hey let's go check it out so i go out there and sure enough they're like hey mikey d what are you doing babe great to see you everything else and you know and two people before me said he was the most awful human being ever i was like you know i don't know and they said well that's just because you're the boss i was like I don't, I don't know if that's it, but all right. Everybody whatever. knows we'll that Nadia it up. is the hey, boss. In that case, it. you can have my title. From now on, you could be whatever title you want. You could take the title, <laughs> all right? Put it on your business card, whatever you'd like, okay? Whatever you want. <laughs> cool, cool. So, Chris, you got the first taste of Mikey D up there. That's actually him on a three out of ten being wound up. What do you think? Yeah. Well, we played with him. Oh, yeah, in, yeah. Up in that's Sedona. Right, yeah. yeah. The first time I saw him, I'm like, wait, you're Joe's older brother, right? Yeah, no <laughs> doubt. I like that. It's yeah. a kick in the ass that he's younger than me. I'm I like, wow. Hey, I was like also, nine years Hey, Joey. Yeah, I got I got to admit, dude, I did get a little down on myself because a few people around here got the uh, podcast. They were super excited about it. They said, man, that was cool. That was cool. That was that was clearly your brother. Right. 
And I was like, oh, dude, you mean that old bald dude? Damn. <laughs> I said, why do, why do you say that? He says, man, you guys sure look alike. I was like, oh, jeez. Nice. Yeah. Well, yeah. sorry. Hey, you, uh, you know what? You're nine years behind me, pal. Hey. You, you ain't getting any better. You know that. No, right? I know. You nine years. You're getting any prettier. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I really have a challenge that would be hilarious, but you've already made your mold into this thing. I wish on day one I would have sent you with a day with Mikey. And I think your head would have exploded. It could have. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Literally just exploded. <laughs> uh, it could have gone two ways. Either I would have gravitated towards him or I would have walked off five minutes yeah. afterwards. Or you might have buried him in the bottom of one of those ponds. Yeah. True. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> so, hi. so Chris, uh, you know what there's, as far as our company is concerned, there aren't really more steps. You know, there's an evolution. You know what, you're definitely, you know, we'll get more properties. We very comfortable with thinking mm -hmm. that you could lead one or multiple ones, right? But do you are you going to pursue the next step in the PGA process of going through the PGA program? So I have come to the realization that I am probably going to do that because what I want to do is I want to put my footprint of what I think a PGA person should be, not the stereotypical old white guy, stuffy, this is how you do things. I want the Beef Johnsons of the world. I want everybody with the tattoos now and going everything else. I want it to change because one of the things that really kind of irks me right now is is the is what people have perceived of what golfers should be. And right now there is a topic out there that just absolutely is mind blowing is should there be hoodies a lot on the golf course? I'm like, <laughs> are you kidding me? Seriously, yeah, I mean, dude. people are freaking out over that. And I'm like, come on. Guests call up, hey, do you guys have a uh, address code? And I said, yeah, just don't come in a fig leaf. I yeah, said, yeah, yeah. I said, yeah, you, want, you want to wear your jorts? You want to wear your, your crop tops? Come on out. I mean, I got a friend who comes out and plays them flip-flops. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So no, it's whatever you. you want to be. You want to be comfortable? Be comfortable. Yeah, Golf is get, stuffy enough. We get a lot yeah. of the white tee tuck into sweats in the yeah. winter. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, that's cool. You, you, me, you mean to tell me hoodies. after Terrell Hatton and Rory wore a hoodie, they're actually discussing whether or not they should allow hoodies, dude? Yeah, <laughs> it's ridiculous. Yeah. Let's hey, talk about that. That is ridiculous. Hey, I am curious, too, because, you know, you seemed pretty fired up when we asked that question are you going to go through the next stages with like a chip on your shoulder trying to say like hey you know i'm making it just like all of you and i'm so different or are you going to go kind of sing the song and dance eat the shit a little bit from the program and then at the end of it say yeah i'm this decorated stellar pga guy and by the way i don't fit the mold at all i'm going to go in there and try to shuffle things up Good All luck right. on that one. Yeah, I know. Uh, yeah, let me know. And I, I think that you should go through it if you want to. And there is some valuable stuff you'll learn. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, my, my mindset has always been this. I don't think it was, it definitely didn't evolve towards what customers want and behavior. Um, I don't think it was ever focused enough on service, sales, marketing. Um, but I realized that the program was built around upholding the tradition of the game, which mm -hmm. makes us all puke the statement by itself, but also to manage a private club. Right. right. Um, so that's why I've never required it or needed it. We have some that are PGA members and they're great guys, you know, but um, it's something that you like to learn um, and you'll take some good stuff from it and you'll understand what doesn't work within the, a system, whether it's ours or not, too. So I, th I think you'll enjoy it. And the only question, the only thing I got, and I would really want to hear this, we're going to have you back to to okay. share this, but. So you're going to go in there guns blazing. So I really want to see how that goes. I thought you might just go, just stay quiet like the guy on Big Brother and he ends up winning at the end, right? He stays mm -hmm. under the radar and then spikes the ball at the end. Yeah. But okay. So would yeah. you please keep us up to speed on Absolutely. how that goes? Absolutely. Yeah. I'm going to be like the guy on Survivor, comes yeah. out, wins every challenge, beats that later, and then gets voted off. Yes. Cool. All yeah. right. You carry the team to victory. And then the last week they say, we cashed your check, you're out. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, as far as being a golf professional, I crack on it a lot. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? We all do. But the reality is that we're all in this business, right? And I love it. I wouldn't trade it for the world. And through my uh, experience, we've done a lot of work for highly successful entrepreneurs that make a gazillion times more than I do that tried to recruit me into other fields. And whether I was good at it, I don't know. Um, but I didn't do it because I do generally love the business. I love the people. I love the interaction. I love the game. And that's why I'm so glad to have guys like Chris and Drew and Mikey because and, I actually view it as a family, right? And, you know, I've shared this before that uh, 
you know, I've actually been, I actually like to learn too. I read a lot of books, you know, all this and that. And I always kind of thought about success because when I was mentoring some highly, highly successful people, which I love, which made major impacts in my life, I was always searching for the best definition of success, right? You know, is it based on how much money you have, how many homes you have, whatever, right? And Zig Ziglar had the best one of all time. It's when you have enough in life of things that money uh, that money can buy and everything in life that money can't buy, right? Mm -hmm. And I think the golf business, when you go through it, you'll see this too, you can make a good living at it. You know what I mean? And you can make six digits in it. You know, are you ever gonna make millions? Mm, you know, you better, you know, it, it's possible, but it's a little tougher than most fields. And then the second, you know, definition of success I really like too is the opportunity to do what you love with who you love, right? Mm -hmm. You know. And I think you feel it within the Dobson family, right? It's not, it's not as much of just business as it's a group of people that care about each other. Absolutely. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we love you too, Chris. So uh, yeah. Mikey, uh, Drew, no. any thoughts? No, I think we touched, uh, touched hey, I just on wanted a to send a quick and... message out to all the golf professionals out there. We have an opportunity that's once in a lifetime between all of the social platforms between all of the cool influencers that are out there now, between Coach Rusty and Hole in One Trick Shots and many others, Golf Bald and Golf Gods. We have the PGA Tour now that's full, filled with young studs making millions, dating supermodels. Can we just evolve at least into being a more inclusive, more diverse, more cool, more laid back environment that will, I guarantee, attract more and more golfers because let's be real it's not like golf is really all that expensive these days any either especially for nice daily fee uh public golf in in a neighborhood near you so it's like it's the place to be and then uh and in and you know and then without excluding the older folks too they want they're looking for a fountain of youth i mean they have like nothing to do and so they're going to go to where it makes them feel good so mm -hmm. it's our opportunity Let's rock the house. We're excited. You're going to continue to grow with the team, fam, everything too. I think Mikey's message to golf professionals in the golf business, you know, it's it's a rocky world out there. There's a lot of uncertainty. And if we just bring a smile, that's our motto. Hope we make you smile. So um, we're going to go ahead and just take a quick break. And then we're just going to do one fun thing when we come back. And then we're going to be done. But, you know, on this note that uh, we're going to actually play uh, me and my Pro V, one of Mikey D's and Cowboy Kenny T's smash hits. And the reason we share it is because every golf professional needs to play with a Pro V want. If not, there's no way they could have fun. Enjoy hey, the for video. the record, guys, just so you know, just due to the today's subject, I do have my Honda Classic shirt on with my Titleist hat. And for the record, I actually I did pay cost. So it wasn't full <laughs> retail, but I did pay for this hat. So since you got 50% off on the hat, Titleist is a major sponsor of the show. <laughs> yep. Okay, cool. All right, we're going to take a quick break. We'll see you in a second. <laughs> Slide a pro V out of the sleeve Grab my big stick, baby, would you please Lay it down on the tee, bring the heat The title is three, me and my pro -V. I pray I bust it straight and stay away from the lake Gotta keep my pearl dry Now that you're looking all shiny and sweet You know how I'm gonna tee you high and let her fly for me, my pro V, my pro V, just me and my pro V. Let her fly for me, my pro V, my pro V, just me and my pro V. Won't you fly with me, fly with me, as far as we can go. Won't you fly with me, fly with me, straight into the hole. Hey everybody, welcome back. Uh, thanks for staying tuned. I hope you enjoyed that me and my pro V, something I know nothing about because <laughs> I would only lose them. Yeah. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and have a little fun. We're gonna have a contest here. The Masters is coming up. Um, so we're going to go ahead and choose who we think is gonna win. Um, I think we're gonna put a score down to make sure you get close. If they miss the cut, we've declared that you're automatically last place. 
Um, yeah. So who are Absolutely. we going to do teams? I think that the only way to do the teams based on the theme of the show is let's do professional golfers versus golf professionals. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Drew, two weeks ago after you broke 100 for the first time and you talked to Brendan Jelly, yep. you know what I mean? You were inspired. He's and my you, inspiration. He, yeah. Yes, absolutely. You went, you called the ESPN, you called the Golf Channel. Um, they didn't call you back, no. but you did make the major announcement that you turned professional. We're going. Absolutely. So Drew is technically declared. He is a professional. Mikey, I know like uh, about 10, 15 years ago, you got motivated half in the bag in Las Vegas. You called me, declared that you were going pro. Um, you double bogeyed the first hole. Um, you quit and then you went back to the bar. Yep. So, but technically <laughs> I think you're still a professional I golfer. Did. Yeah. Nice. So it, it'll be Mikey D and Drew versus Chris and I, a little generational thing here too. So we're going to pick who we think is going to win and we'll pick how many under par we think is a tiebreaker. Right. And if it's the same people, it's the same people, I guess. Mm -hmm. But what we're going to do is who finishes highest based on place. So if I pick somebody that finishes fourth, you pick somebody that finishes 30th, Mm -hmm. that's a total of 34. Yeah. Get it. Right. And if you miss the cut, you get like what, 72 or something. Right. Yep. Because I think they're, what, 70 70 make the cut. So you get a 71 if you miss the cut. Right. Okay. And the reason why I think we're going to win you heard it right, Chris. What question did he ask when he talked about the Masters? <laughs> so this is one of our fearless leaders. He asked, where is the Masters being played at? They still yeah. haven't answered it. Yeah. I don't think that it's even, you, can, you can't warrant giving an answer to that. Drew, you're going to have to Google that because we, we can't. <laughs> that's, one that question. that's one thing as a millennial I can do. I will Google it. Oh, absolutely. So let's go ahead and write hey, it Hey, does down. anybody know if there's going to be spectators? Uh, that Limited does make a difference. I heard, yes. Oh, wow. That's cool. There is. Phil Mickelson said that he was a little nervous about having spectators at the Masters. Okay, well, he's 50 now. You know oh, I thought I mean? you said Mickelson was going to spectate this year because he's so bad. Yeah. <laughs> All right. That was a hint for those that didn't know. That was Mikey telling me slyly not to pick Phil. He's one of the three golfers I know. All right, so I wrote mine down. And then, Mikey, write yours down. Don't tell us yet. Oh, I forgot to write my score down, so... Actually, Eric's got a pen for you. Actually, I'll write it down here. All right, Mikey, what is your answer? The lock of the century. Our boy Tony Finau, 13 unch. All right, not bad pick. He's got the course record at Bali High, one of our properties in Los Angeles. Oh, really? Nice. And I can tell you that's probably will be his best accomplishment, even if he wins the Masters. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> All Drew, right. who do you got? Dude, I went with one of the four golfers I know. Mikey helped me out. I'm not picking Phil, so I went with Bryson at six under. Yeah, that's what I picked. So I'm going to cheat and go a different one because I don't want the same as you. Yeah. All right, who are you going with? All right, this is a shout-out to my beautiful wife, Valerie. Matt Wolf, minus 10. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go with somebody that should win a lot more, but he got married, and you know what I mean? I don't know. He just not a finisher. I'm going to go with Rory. All right. All right. And I'm going to go. Actually, I was going to go DeChambeau, 14 under, but I'm going to go Rory, 11. All right. There you have it, right? So we got Rory and Matt Wolf. You two got Tony Finau and Bryson DeChambeau. Um, so can't wait to go ahead and watch the Masters, one of the best moments of the year. Thank you, Chris, oh. for being on the show. We're definitely going to have you back. So glad you're on the team. You're doing amazing. And I'm mm-hmm. glad that you actually pivoted to the golf business. I appreciate everything. Thank you, gentlemen. Yeah, Absolutely. Was fun. And thank you all for watching. And we uh, hope we made you smile. And we can't wait to see you guys next time. Absolutely. From the tee to the green, from the P to the B. Drop the plum bop, lose the plum bop, it's a plum bop. From the T's to the green, and the P to the B.